Hello. This video discusses the simplest of all frequency compensation techniques known as parallel compensation or more commonly as dominant pole compensation. So let's begin with the problem statement. Let's say we have a two pole system. For example, a two stage amplifier. Gain of this amplifier can be modeled using voltage control current sources and associated poles or bandwidth can be modeled using node capacitor and resistors. Gain and bandwidth of these individual stages are given by these equations. Let's assume that the gain and bandwidth of these two stages are of same order of magnitude. Let's now draw the Bode plot of these two stages individually. So here we have gain plot on the top and the phase plot on the bottom. Here we have assumed first stage to have little higher gain and second stage to have little higher bandwidth, which is quite typical in amplifier design. Recall that gain bandwidth product will be constant along this roll of line. Using the Bode plot of individual gain stages, we can now draw the Bode plot of the total amplifier. So here this red line indicates the Bode plot of the magnitude of the total gain and this red line over here indicates the Bode plot of the phase of the total gain. This vertical green line over here indicates the 0 dB frequency or unity gain frequency of the total gain plot. So in this case the phase at unity gain frequency is minus 180 degree. Now if we recall the definition of phase margin which is 180 minus phase at unity gain frequency then phase margin in this case is very close to 0. And a 0 phase margin indicates that this system is not very stable. In fact, in general, any two-stage amplifier or any higher order amplifier is unstable if it is not deliberately frequency compensated. Now let's say we want to change this system to make the phase margin 45 degrees. Keep in mind that in the real design, probably you want to keep phase margin even higher, maybe 60 degrees or 70 degrees. Here I am explaining the ideas using 45 degrees because for this phase margin unity gain frequency and second pole frequency are equal. In dominant pole compensation, one of the frequency is moved in. That means frequency of the one of the pole, which is in most cases the lower pole, is reduced. To better understand how this improves the phase margin, let's reduce the frequency a little. So here we have reduced the first pole frequency without changing the gain. This can be done by increasing the capacitor C1. Now let's see how it changes the Bode plot of total gain. Here dashed red line indicates the Bode plot of the magnitude of the new gain. Notice here that the unity gain frequency of the total gain plot has also moved in. Although not as much as we have moved the first frequency. Phase margin of this new system is also zero although we are moving in the right direction. So let's reduce the pole frequency further. So we have reduced the first pole even further and unity gain frequency of total gain plot has also moved in more. But in order to achieve 45 degrees phase margin, we need to move this unity gain frequency so that it coincides with the second pole frequency. So let's redraw this plot so that we have some more room to reduce the frequency. So now we have some more room. I will start by drawing the desired total gain plot. So now we have moved the first pole so much that the unity gain frequency now coincides with the second pole frequency. In order to see the new phase margin, let's now draw the new phase plot. And from this new phase plot, we can now see that phase margin is around 45 degrees. In order to achieve this total gain and phase plot, of course, we need to move the first pole by this much. If we want to achieve higher phase margin, we need to keep moving this pole further inside. So now let's take an example to better appreciate the values involved. So let's assume that these are the design parameters of the uncompensated first and second gain stages. We have assumed first stage to have higher gain and lower bandwidth and second stage to have lower gain and higher drive. So let's plot these values to visualize them better. So here are the approximate gain plot. So now let's see how we want to modify the system. To achieve the 45 degree phase margin, we want to move the first pole such that the unity gain frequency of the total gain plot is equal to the second pole. Now we need to calculate what is this frequency. 
we can use the fact that along the 20 dB rule of line, the gain bandwidth product is constant. So we know the gain bandwidth product at this point, which is 1 mega, and we know the gain at this point, which is 50,000. So if we do this calculation, we find the value of 20 radians per second. So we need to change our first pole frequency from 100k to 20, which is more than three decades lower, as we can see from this graph as well. Now let's calculate how much we need to increase C1 to achieve this frequency. So the new C1 value is 10 nanofarad, which is actually much larger than the original value 2 picofarad. This is actually not very surprising because if we need to reduce the frequency by more than three decades, then we need to increase the capacitor by more than three decades. Now for a fully on-chip design, 10 nanofarad is a very large value of capacitor. At the same time, the unity gain frequency has been reduced from hundreds of mega to one mega, which is again not very desirable. In order to improve the area and the performance, dominant pole compensation often utilizes what is known as pole zero cancellation. The idea behind pole zero cancellation is to introduce a left hand plane zero in the system along with the dominant pole. This new left hand plane zero is used to cancel the second pole. But before we go into that, let's first understand how this left hand plane zero is created. Let's consider a parallel RC circuit driven by an ideal current source. This is quite similar to the model of first and second stage of our amplifier. Since this circuit contains just one capacitor, it's first order system. In fact, it has one pool. In dominant pool compensation, in order to reduce the frequency of the pool, we increase the capacitor C1, in general by connecting another capacitor in parallel with C1. Although, it looks like that it should now be a second order system since there are now two capacitor. In fact, since these two capacitors are in parallel, there is only one big capacitor. So it is still a first order system. In order to create a left hand plane zero, a resistor is connected in series with capacitor CC. Keep in mind this resistor can also be placed on the top of CC. Since these two components are in series, it doesn't really matter. After connecting this resistor, now this system becomes a second order system because C1 and CC are no more in parallel. As we can see from this equation, we now have a left hand plane zero in the system. But at the same time, we have a second order denominator now, which means there is an additional pole in the system. In order to calculate the pole frequencies, either we can solve this second order equation, which will result in cumbersome formula, or we can make some reasonable assumptions to simplify this equation. We make the assumption that CC is much greater than C1. This is a reasonable assumption as we have seen before in our example where CC was three orders of magnitude larger than C1. So after making these assumptions, the two pole frequencies can be approximated with these equations. Before we go further with these equations, notice that one can think of creating a zero by putting the resistance in series with C1. But in most practical design, C1 is not one physical capacitor but it is a parasitic capacitance of many transistors. So trying to create a zero by placing resistance in series with this parasitic capacitance is not a good idea. Coming back to our poles and zero equations, let's now try to derive these equations intuitively. In order to derive the equations of poles and zero intuitively, let's recall some basic facts. Poles in the transfer function cause the magnitude of transfer function to reduce and zeros cause the magnitude of transfer function to increase. In general, they tend to arrest the fall caused by poles. Another fact worth remembering is that passive elements always cause poles and zeros in left hand plane. And the final fact is about the capacitors, that they offer high impedance at low frequencies and low impedance at high frequencies. Coming back to our RC network, at very low frequencies, capacitors C1 and CC act as open circuit. So we can redraw this circuit containing just resistance R1. As we increase the frequencies, at some frequency CC comes into the picture and this circuit becomes an RC circuit. Our first pole frequency is the frequency where impedance offered by the capacitor CC 
is equal to impedance offered by the series resistance R1 and Rz. As we keep on increasing the frequency, the impedance of CC continues to fall and that causes the fall of the magnitude. And in Bode plot, this is our first minus 20 dB per decade roll off. As we keep on increasing the frequencies, after certain frequencies, CC becomes so low that we can consider it a short circuit and hence ignore it. This second frequency is a frequency at which impedance of CC is equal to impedance of RZ and it is our zero frequency. Since after this frequency, the network again becomes a pure resistive network, the magnitude stops to fall. In Bode plot, this means that minus 20 dB per decade roll off has been arrested and that is the effect of the zero. As we keep on increasing the frequency, after a certain frequency, capacitor C1 starts to become important. This is the frequency where impedance offered by capacitor C1 is equal to impedance offered by parallel combination of R1 and Rz. This in fact is our second pole frequency. As impedance of C1 continues to fall after this frequency, the impedance of this network continues to fall. And this fall is represented by this minus 20 dB per decade rule of reason. In actual design practice, Rz is actually much smaller than R1. So we can further simplify this equation by ignoring Rz in this equation and by ignoring R1 in this equation. As you can see from this plot, that left hand plane 0 nullifies the effect of left hand plane pole. In pole 0 cancellation, we design this 0 to be of same frequency as the pole we want to cancel. In our example, we want to design this 0 frequency to be equal to the pole frequency of the second stage. Assuming the exact pole 0 cancellation, meaning that the frequency of pole and frequency of 0 are exactly equal, the effect of this cancellation is to effectively remove the second stage pole from the system. And after this cancellation, we are only left with this pole and this pole. So let's understand this pole 0 cancellation better by drawing the body diagram. So starting with the uncompensated two pole system, we want to place our new 0 at the second pole and our new pole beyond the unity gain frequency. So after the frequency compensation, the Bode plot looked like this dashed red line. Effectively, our first pole has moved in and the second pole has moved out. And as we can see, now we have a healthy phase margin in the system. Next, we want to derive the equations for the component Rz and Cc. Since there are two unknowns, Rz and Cc, we need to find two equations. Obviously, for a perfect pole zero cancellation, we would like our zero frequency to be exactly equal to our second pole frequency. So this gives us our first equation. After the frequency compensation, the first pole frequency or the bandwidth is given by this equation. Here I have ignored the Rz to make the equation simple. The gain of the amplifier is given by this equation. So now we can calculate the gain bandwidth product of the amplifier. In order to achieve 45 degree phase margin, we want our new second pole to be equal to this gain bandwidth product. In general, we would like to have better than 45 degrees phase margin. That means we would like the second pole to be higher than this gain bandwidth product. So let's assume that we want the second pole to be k times higher than gain bandwidth product where k is greater or equal to 1. And this condition gives us our second equation. Note that we have ignored R1 here to make things simple. So now we can solve these two equations to find the values of Rz and Cc. So here are our final equations. In order to develop a better insights, let's do some simplifications. Let's assume that our first and second stage amplifiers are exactly identical and parameter k is 1. So after making these assumptions, we find that our compensation capacitance value is gain times capacitor and the zero resistance value is just inverse of gm. So in general, the compensation capacitance value will be hundreds of times larger than the stage capacitors. And zero resistance value will be few kilo ohms to tens of kilo ohms. So we see that assumptions we made in deriving the pole zero equations are mostly valid. Finally, now let's calculate the values of CC and RZ for the examples we have considered before. 
So we saw previously that without the zero, the compensation capacitance is around 10 nanofarad and the first pole frequency which is the system bandwidth is around 20 radians per second. So after using the pole zero cancellation, the new value of RZ and CC are these. So we can see the first benefit immediately that required capacitance is around 70 times smaller. And at the same time the first pole frequency or the system bandwidth is 70 times larger. Next, let's consider the unity gain frequency before and after the compensation. So we know that unity gain frequency of uncompensated amplifier is the geometric mean of the unity gain frequencies of individual amplifiers. Unity gain frequency after compensation is given by this equation, which is pretty similar to the frequency before compensation except this factor k. For 45 degree phase margin, k is 1. That means we can achieve the same unity gain frequency as uncompensated amplifier. This in fact is quite remarkable because that means that even after adding a large compensation capacitor, we could retain the unity gain frequency to be the same. But in a practical design, phase margin is kept higher than 45 degrees. That means the achievable unity gain frequency would be little smaller than the uncompensated amplifier's unity gain frequency. To end the video, let's make some remarks about the disadvantages of dominant pole compensation techniques. In fact, these disadvantages make us look after other compensation techniques. The first disadvantage is that pole zero cancellation is never perfect. In fact, in certain cases, the second pole is not a fixed pole, but it moves with the load conditions. Although to first order, we can make out for the movement of poles by moving the zero as well load dependent but this complicates the design. But the main concern about the imperfect pole zero cancellation is the settling behavior. If pole zero cancellation is not perfect, then settling time will have a frequency component equal to the difference of these frequencies. In fact, there is a well-cited paper on this topic. The second disadvantage is required compensation capacitor. This compensation capacitor is still in hundreds of picofarad, which is relatively large for an on-chip design. Despite these disadvantages, this composition technique is frequently used in many circuits. A common example is a linear voltage regulator or LDO, which is compensated using external or off-chip capacitors. Simple voltage buffers or band gap circuits where settling is not a big concern, this technique is frequently used. And with that, we come to the end of the video. So post your comments below and thanks for watching.